Good morning. Good morning, Faith City. Good morning, church. Good morning, the body of Christ. Amen. I pray you've had a good week this week. That um, you've had revelation in the Lord this week. Hallelujah. Good morning, live stream. Pray you're uh, warm and, and well this morning. You've had a great week. Bless you in Jesus' name. It's become apparent to me um, recently with the sudden death of some close family friends, uh, both men of God with uh, family um, with family left behind, um, that how fragile the life that we live here that we've been given is and how quickly um, the end can come and um, that the body we've been given this body that's soft and and, um, supple to this world and which harbors our spirit and our soul and the real a real urgency that is that there is to be continually right with God be ready be ready. The seriousness of your eternity is very real. And I can't guarantee that you will be here tomorrow in this church, living, breathing. All right? I can't guarantee that. But praise God, He can promise us an eternity with Him. Amen. That this is not the end. Hallelujah. Thessalonians 5. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates... We do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Hallelujah. So you've got these two things that are awaiting us. One, death, which means life. And when the Lord comes back, we don't know which those two dates are. So there's an urgency to be ready for tomorrow. Amen. Amen. And that we need to take heed and listen to the spiritual food that flows from this pulpit. Now, today, not tomorrow. I know we may sit in church and, oh, it's great to listen, but we need to act out the faith. We need to act out what's in this word and show that we have been impacted by God as a reassurance for our tomorrow. Amen. Hallelujah. I thank you that we are so blessed to have such spiritual food from Pastor Leafi and Pastor Fear that that they preach with passion from this pulpit. Yeah. Hallelujah. Obedient to Christ. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that yourselves are God's temple? And that the Spirit of God dwells in your midst. Hallelujah. Do you not know that your temple, that you are temples of the Holy Spirit? 1 John 4 4. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in this world. Hallelujah. How can we live ready to embrace the eternity that the Lord has promised us with Him in paradise? in paradise and we thank Jesus for what he did on that cross and he hung there so that we could be given the spirit that gives us the power to overcome what is in this world we may be in it but we're not part of it we need to realize that we need to unite with that we need to raise our hand to Christ we need to give him thanks for what he's done hallelujah oh God, you're so good. You're so good, Lord. You care for us in a way that we could not imagine, Father. And we just try and lay lay it all down for you, Lord, this morning. We lay our lives out, Lord, Father, afresh this morning and trust and faith and in a hope that will not be put to shame that when we do leave, Lord, and let there be an urgency in the church, Lord, Father, this morning, to ready themselves for tomorrow, Lord Father, to be ready for Christ, 
to be ready to embrace your arms and not to gamble their future, Lord Father, with the love of this world. Hallelujah. And let's praise your name, Lord Father. We pour out your spirit this morning, Lord God. Touch the hearts of the people in their homes and the church. Father, you see, we see Faith City Church. We see a TV screen, Lord, but you see a nation. You see a world, Lord Father. You roll out of Mount Zion, Lord God, and we praise you, Lord Father, and we give you all thanks, all praise, and all glory from the pulpit, from our hearts, and from this nation, Lord God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Here we go. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah is to our God. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. 
Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God in the highest. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to come and worship you. You alone are deserving of our worship, Lord God, and we bless you this morning. We honor you this morning. We glorify your name. You're a good God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are grateful, Lord God, that you're in our lives. We thank you that you're mighty in our midst, and we bless your holy name. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Well, say hi to somebody. I was going to sing a song, but I thought, you don't know my song so long. You just go ahead and say hello to somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> nope. Fantastic. You can find your seat again. Welcome to church. It's great to see you. Hallelujah. Look at these beautiful people out there. Incredible. Also, I want to welcome everyone who's watching via live stream this morning. Welcome to our service. We pray you're blessed where you are at and that you enjoyed the worship this morning. But we're going to take up the offering now. So if I could have a couple of people to uh, distribute the bags. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let me pray. Faithful God, we thank you for your work in each of our hearts and each of our lives. This morning, we, as we worship, Lord God, we reflect upon your goodness. We reflect upon your mercy, Lord God. We reflect upon the great work, Lord God, that you are doing and transforming us, Lord God, into the people you're calling us to be. And this morning, Lord God, out of that gratitude we give, Lord God, we want to worship you with our offerings this morning. Lord, receive it, Lord God, as, as sweet uh, worship before your throne. Lord, bless the gift and the giver that this offering will go to the extension of your kingdom, that others would come to know the glorious name of Jesus, just as we have. Hallelujah. Amen. Fantastic. Just as the bags are being passed around, I have a couple of notices. So hopefully you picked up your bulletin as you came through the doors this morning. If you're with us online this morning, you can view our bulletin through the church website, which is www.fcc.net.nz, and you should find the weekly bulletin tab there. But just a couple of things we want to uh, highlight this morning. Leadership Paper Tea, we are having our next Leadership Paper Tea this coming Friday. It'll be here at the church at 6 p.m. Bring your favorite takeaways, your favorite uh, food that you want to eat. We'll have a time of fellowship as we eat together, and then we will gather around the vision of the house. It'll just be a great time as, we, as we're coming to the end of the year. That's how crazy it is. November tomorrow. It's kind of, kind of bizarre. So this will probably be our second to last leadership uh, gathering, so please do come along. It'll be a great time together. Also, you'll notice there that we have a visiting ministry coming to us in a couple of Sundays' time. Pastor Mike and Michelle Coe from Timaru will be with us. We're going to be really blessed. If you're unfamiliar with uh, Pastor Mike, he uh, is currently on the national executive serving with Pastor Liafi on our national leadership for the Assemblies of God New Zealand. He's a charismatic young man who loves the Lord and, and is passionate about leadership in churches and passionate about young people rising up in the, in, the, uh, in the kingdom. And so we're going to have a great weekend. There's going to be a couple of special meetings with that. There will be a young adult and young couples uh, gathering on the Friday night with him, and they're going to be really blessed with that. Um, also, the youth will be gathering with him, and he'll be ministering here on Sunday as well. So it's going to be a good weekend, so do mark that in your calendars. Make a note of being here or tuning in if you're watching online. It'll be great. Uh, Great time together. Also, again, I do want to uh, press to you, small groups, please be part of a small group. It is really important during these times that we are fellowshipping, that we are gathering around the Word, that we are delving into the Word together. If you're not yet part of a small group, please, please do see the office or talk to uh, Chris 
or myself, and we can help you get in with that. But that's all I have this morning. Why don't we give our senior pastor a hand as he comes to share the word? Amen. Uh, starting on the 8th of uh, next month, we have a two weeks of prayer and fasting. So um, that will not just be for our church. That will be for the rest of our movement, but just letting you know that that's coming up. There's much that we can uh, do, but we can't do it without prayer. Someone many years ago, one of the church fathers said, it seems to me that God will do nothing on earth except in answer to somebody's prayer. And the late uh, Miles Monroe said, uh, prayer is uh, earthly permission for heavenly interference. We need God to interfere with our lives, but we need to give him the permission to do that. So we're going to go on a two-week of prayer and fasting, and uh, we'll let you give you more details next week. We've been talking on the love of God. I don't think that we will ever be able to exhaust uh, the love of God. We are going to fall in love with Jesus over and over and over again when we get to heaven. Hallelujah. And uh, God loves us, and uh, we are created in love. We created in his image, and that image is not just the form. That image, that image is not, tripart, not just tripartite. That image is an image of love. Hallelujah. So um, we've been talking about the church of Ephesus, a powerful, powerful church, but a fallen church. We can have a powerful congregation that is fallen. And uh, the Bible uh, uh, highlights uh, the church in Ephesus as the loveless church. And yet, Paul wrote to that church to be established in love that they might know the magnificence of the love of God. That church had a, a great member whose name was John the Apostle, who is the Apostle of Love, who also wrote to the church. Historians and tradition tell us that even the first, second, and third letter that was written by John was also written to the church there, and it emphasizes the love and the grace of God. Hallelujah. We can be a great church, but if we are a loveless church, something is wrong with the way that we understand. We will never be fulfilled until you love. And love is centered on somebody else. It's not centered on us, but it behoves us to center our lives on somebody else. That's why God loved the world that he gave, and he gave himself. He gave the best. Heaven, in a sense, was bankrupt when Jesus came. God became man. God became human, and uh, that human being, God became human and died on the cross for us. That is love at its greatest manifestation. And the Bible tells us and, and intimate that maybe for a good man, somebody will die. But for an enemy, nobody will die. You want to smash the face of the enemy. Uh, but Jesus came, and while we were yet sinners, while we were still enemies to him, he died for us. And so we have been talking about that church, and that church is not just a, a, a model church for, for them at the time. It's a model church for us that you might know with all the saints, that's including us, the length and the depth and the height and the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah that you might know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. How can you know something that surpasses your knowledge? Well, don't try and figure that out. Let's just live it. And if we just live it as God's people, then uh, uh, we will be fulfilled. We will never be fulfilled until we love. Are you all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are, we are commanded to love because there is more to us than what we know. 
There's actually more to, to the church. More, there's more in us than what we practice. And many of us, as we shared before, many of us drive at 50 Ks an hour for the rest of our lives when we are capable of 220. Now, I know if you drive 220, you're breaking the law. But I'm saying the potential, there is more to us than what we practice and what we know. We are more than conquerors. In all these things that go on in life, and sometimes they can be very, very unfair. Talking to a couple of uh, men last night, and one of them asked a question. Pastor, I want to ask you a question. I said, what's your question? He said, you know, I've lived for God most of my life, and then somebody two days before they die, they, 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 they repent and they go to heaven. And I said to him, and you think that's unfair? He said, yes, I've been living for God all my life. I said, the problem is you think that because you've served God, that now you actually can earn something. You can't earn heaven. Heaven is given freely if you give your life to Jesus. And even though you gave your life to Jesus many years ago, the man that gets saved two days before he dies, you come to heaven the same way, he comes to heaven the same way. He may not get a lot of reward because he only got saved two days before he died, but he gets to heaven the same way everyone gets to heaven. And it may be unfair to you, but it's righteous in the eyes of God. And I thought, man, I, uh, that was a good answer. <laughs> Hallelujah. God loves us, and we are not fulfilled until we practice what we are born for and created for. And there is much more to us and much more that we can do than what we've been practicing. And we are capable of loving beyond what, what we have done. We are capable of something far more. We are more than conquerors. We are the head and not the tail. Now, that's an, not an arrogant statement. That's what the Bible says. The church ought to be the head and not the tail. We are the first and not the last. We are above and not beneath. Why? Because we ought to, to express God in our lives. Hallelujah. Are you okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. If you ever look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9, it says, We are hard pressed on every side, <laughs> yet not crushed. We are more than what we think. We are perplexed, but not in despair. And the, the climate today, we could get into despair. We could get into a, a depression. But the Bible says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. That's, that's, you know, many times when we're persecuted, we think uh, that the earth is coming to an end. We are not forsaken. We are not looking at the circumstances. We are looking at the one who is eternal. Amen. Hallelujah. And he said, I will never forsake you, and I will never neglect you. Are you okay? Persecuted, but not uh, struck down, not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. You're struck down, but you're not destroyed. And we need to have an eternal perspective of God because we are born again. The eyes of our understanding are open to the magnificence and the magnitude of life, life more abundantly that Christ came to impart. Hallelujah. Are you okay? Jesus said, you're capable of doing it. If, 
if, if somebody compels you to go one mile, and you know the story, you know the, the, the culture at the time, a Roman soldier can on any given time, on any given day, just put a burden on you and tell you to carry it for him for, two, for, for one mile. Jesus said he can do two. We are capable of more than what we've lived. And we, when one compels you to walk with him one mile, and you know it's your obligation as a Jew to carry that, that whatever it is, and you carry it one mile without ever complaining. You may be complaining inside, but uh, you can't complain because, <laughs> hallelujah. And you think Jesus did not understand that that's what had happened and still happens. But Jesus said, if you're compelled to go one mile, try to. Because when you finish one mile, you finish your obligation to that soldier or that official but then they say, okay, the one mile is finished. And he said, no, 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 well, I'll take it another mile. Now, when you take it another mile, by the end of that mile, there'll be a friend. Your obligation is finished. But by the time you finish the second mile, there will be a camaraderie, a friendship, because you've gone beyond, like we said this morning, we are capable of much more than we've lived. Are you all right? There is more to the five loaves and two fishes <laughs> than what you think. And when you look at your five loaves and two fishes, you say, what is that? But there is more to that when it's handed over to the one that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, your five loaves and two fishes can feed the multitude. We were at a conference one time, and I said to my wife, because uh, it was a huge conference, and all these high-caliber speakers were there. And it was great. But they spoke way above the heads of everybody. And I, I talked to my wife. I said, there has to be a, a, a child here with five loaves and two fishes to feed this conference. We're relying so much on this, all these capable men and capable women. But there must be a child around this conference who has five loaves and two fishes that will feed this conference. They couldn't find him. Maybe they weren't looking for him. But when Jesus said to the disciples, feed them, he said, we can't do that. A whole year's wage will not even buy enough that everyone can have a little bite. Philip and Andrew said, uh, there's a boy here with five loaves and two fishes. Jesus said, Get it. There's more to us than what we do. There's more to us than how we live. There's more to the five loaves and two fishes. If we would learn to walk leaning on the one who loved us and gave himself for us. The Bible says love can do Love never fails. So here is a great church that is a failed church. The Bible says love never fails. And sometimes we need to stretch beyond what we know. Because we will never know what can happen when we stretch out beyond where we are. And part of uh, that is a time of prayer and fasting that God will just intervene. Not in, just in our city, but in our nation. Hallelujah. There is more in the jar 
than what that lady knew. There's more in her jar of oil. One of them, uh, the prophet said, go find that jar. It's not lost, it's in your house. And if you get all the vessels from all of Wamanui and Turukina and Ratana and Wangahu, get all the vessels that you can, and then close the door and pour the oil. There's more in that little bottle of oil than you think. There's more in your small group than you think. There is more in your leaders than you think. There is more in you than you think. Hallelujah. And that widow of Sarepta did not know that there was more in her little jar and more in her little bin of flour. And as she continues to give it out, it continues to, <laughs> hallelujah, to multiply. Why? Because we are capable of more than we are. We are capable of more than we think. Are you all right? If God puts the solitary in families, then there's somebody out there that's waiting for you to make them your family and make you their family. Uh, David Kitely, if he listens to a the live stream, he'll know I'm talking about him. But he's probably too elderly now to, to hear. David Kitely ministered in Oakland, California. And every time he goes into the office in the morning before the dawn rises uh, to pray, there was a, a homeless man in front of the church trying to cover himself with a blanket. Now, there's a lot of homeless in the United States, but David Kitely will go, and this man was there, and then he began to say hello, and they would talk. His name also was David. His name was David Crabb. And as they talk and dialogue, David Kitely said, if I open the church and turn the heaters on, would you see that the church is looked after? He said, yes, sir. And that happened. Then David Crabb got saved. Today, the two of them are ministering together. Somebody out there that's a solitary person that's looking for, somebody needs to love them into the kingdom of God. David, that great man, you know, we, we're not doing a study on David. But uh, there's a phrase in the Old Testament, the sure mercies of David. Something about the heart of that man that he said to the Lord, don't let me die until I feed my generation and reveal your glory to the coming generation. But David had three generals. One was Joab, the other was Abishai, and uh, the third one was Etai. Now, Etai was a Philistine. In fact, Etai came from the same village as the giant Goliath. He came from Gath. And yet, there was something in the heart of David that embraced this this man who was a foreigner to Israel, that man became a mighty general, one of the three generals that he had because there was a heart to love somebody beyond your walls. I went to a Paparua prison to a visit and... Uh, came across a young man named Ian, done something, and 
I was uh, with a prison fellowship at the time. And uh, came time for Ian to be released. And no one, there was a, a lot of people in prison fellowship, some of them very well to do. And I lived in a little cottage that needs repair in the Peterborough Street in Christchurch. And I thought some of these great guys will have Ian come and release. So in the end, I said, I'll look after him. So they released him from prison to me, much older than me, so I had to look after him, no job, nothing. So uh, he lived at home, and uh, we lived together for about uh, three or four years. He got saved, and, and then he had a car accident, and he was uh, a paraplegic f- from then on, and I had to look after him. I had to work, come home, look after Ian. And when God said, I want you to leave Christ Church and go to, to the North Island, I said to Ian, we're going to the North Island. He said, I want to stay here. I said, all right. So I went and found him a, a home in a village. He's had a little self-contained cottage, which was really nice. And uh, he can wheel his wheelchair all over the place. And he was very, very happy. And I, I left and I came up. And every time I go down, I go and see him. We'll go down and we'll go and see him. And, and uh, I guess in a sense, I left it to the church to keep an eye on him. Then I went down. It's a few years ago, I think it was three or four, five years ago, I, and I went to his cottage again and knocked at the door and a lady came. I said, I'm here to see Ian. And she said, oh, Ian's passed away. And she said, I'm so sorry. I said, it's not your fault. There was a great church down there. There were many Christians down there that could have looked after Ian. But Ian, in the end, was looked after by a lady that comes once a week when the church could have done a whole lot more. We can be a great church that don't love. And there's a solitary person out there. If God sets the solitary in family. then there's somebody out there waiting for you to love them. Mother Teresa said something quite profound. She said, uh, love until it hurts. Love until it hurts. The difficulty is many times when we hurt, (laughs) <laughs> we don't love. Many people, if I, I meet them everywhere. Oh, I got hurt in the church. I got hurt in the church. <laughs> if they get hurt at work, they still go to work. But they get hurt in church, and then they leave church. Love until it hurts. Paul said, you can speak the language of men and angels, but without love, you're nothing. Let me read it. And although I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt but have not love, that means you can give and not love. That's what Ananias and Sapphira did. They gave for their benefit, to show off before the church, hey, they gave everything. But when you give in love, it's amazing what can happen. So you can give, but without love, it's nothing. Love suffers long. So love suffers. <laughs> we were talking about suffering. Jesus was perfected, even though he was a son. He was perfected 
through suffering. And we will never come into an understanding of perfection until we learn that God has a purpose even in our suffering. Hallelujah. But there's a healing in, in the wounds of our love. Many years back, uh, I heard, a, I think it was berries and somebody, it might have been Jasmine and Karina singing a song about the wounded healer came to town. And there's healing in the wounds of our love. By his stripes, the stripes, the stripes actually flow out and heal us. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Hallelujah. And part of that song said, Be of sin the double cure, saved from wrath and made me pure. From thy wounded side which flow. So our wounds can have a life flowing effect. If we just keep walking with God and love until it hurts and love through our hurts. If that would happen, the church will be filled because everyone that's wounded will know, oh, there's going to be a, a river of light that flows from my wounds. And they'll heal. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon so his wounds heal us and they are wounds of love he said they ask him in the book of Zechariah what are those wounds he said, these are wounds that I I suffered at the house of my friend at the house of my friend at the house of my friend and when you're wounded in the church you're wounded at the house of your friend stay and let the life flow from your wounds heal others in the church. Jacob was limping the rest of his life. Can you imagine him walking by and saying, who's that? Why is he like that? Man, what can he do? And someone will say, oh, that's Judah's, uh, that's Judah's uh, father. Judah. Which one? The one with the scepter. You're kidding. Oh, that's Joseph's father. Which Joseph? The prime minister of Egypt. You're kidding. And this wounded man raised so many of these great, great men. Because there are healings in our wounds. We are capable of much more than we're doing. We think we are hard done by just to attend something. We are capable of more. Are you all right? Hallelujah. Imagine Joseph. <laughs> yeah. Nice brothers. Where was he wounded? Wounded by his own brothers. Accused of adultery, which he never did found himself in jail, then found himself in the palace. And his brothers came and he said, you meant it for evil. The unfairness, the wounds of his own heart feared Egypt, feared his family, and feared us, feeding us even today. Himself took our sin on his old body on the tree, that we being dead to sin might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. So there's a healing thing that comes from our wounds, the same way Jesus was. When Moses asked him, can I see your face? He said, no, but you can see my back. He said, what? See your back? What was on his back? The wounds that flowed with healing. So when he saw him, he saw his back, and the Bible says his goodness went by, his glory went by, and he saw his back. Hmm. 
the rivers that flowed out. And Moses said, I'd rather be in the desert with you than be in a city, in a palace with everybody else. There was a young minister. I heard him and heard him quite often. And, and, and many times I heard him, I, I, I get annoyed, you know. And then I heard him, the last time I heard him, a friend of mine uh, in Auckland said, have you heard so-and-so lately? I said, yeah. What do you think? I said, he's different. He's uh, changed. And my friend said, that's because he's been knocked around. Before that, he was so arrogant because he had never made a mistake. I said from this pulpit, and I'll say it again, I love wounded preachers. I'm very, very afraid of preachers that are not wounded. I'm afraid they might see me. But there, are, there, there is a, a healing in our wounds. No one can comfort somebody with a loved one passing away than somebody who's also had their own loved one pass away. There's healing rivers in the wounds of our love. We are capable of much more. Love until it hurts. Let's pray. Maybe some of the things I've shared uh, are real to you. They mean something to you. You just needed somebody to put it together. But you experience those things and you wonder sometimes, not knowing that God is able to give you beauty for ashes, give you the oil of joy for mourning and the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If what we shared as uh, speaking to you touch your heart, I want you to stand because I want to pray for us. Sometimes we are wounded by our friends, <laughs> but there's still healing rivers if we allow God to use the wounds of our love to touch the lives of others. If you're watching live stream from your home or wherever, you can respond the way, well, however you want to respond, but God wants to touch your life and open the eyes of your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I stand with your people today. We stand in your presence, Lord God, and Ask you, Lord, to touch our lives. Thank you for the wounds. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes we don't think those wounds are faithful, but they are. Because out of those wounds will flow rivers of life, rivers of living water. Even as you said to a wounded woman, not wounded physically, but wounded inside. He said, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give to you, it will become in you rivers of water that will spring up to everlasting life. That woman left the well that day and called a whole city. And her wounds became living waters to the Sica, the city in Samaria. And Father, I pray that our wounds, Lord God, will not be areas of our lives, Lord God, that we lash out through, but areas of our life where, Lord, you'll flow through and bring healing to others. Thank you for your word today. Your word, Lord God, is settled in heaven forever. The entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. I pray for your people that as we leave here today, 
that there will be a joy, uh, a joy and a rejoicing. That Lord, that uh, as you are a wounded healer, that we will become wounded healers to the solitary that are without families, to others that may be hurting, and that, Lord, life will flow and healing will come. We bless you and honor you today. You're a good God in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. amen. Have a good Sunday.